Hello, hello everyone. I'm Dr. Neha Narula, family physician here at Stanford Healthcare. And I'm Dr. Olga Goldberg, a comprehensive neurologist at Stanford. Thank you so much for joining us on this educational collaboration between the Department of Neurology and the Department of Primary Care, made possible by the value-based care program. Our goal in these talks is to take a deeper dive into the most common neurologic complaints that we see in primary care and present the latest evidence-based pointers that you can use in your own practice. Joining us today is Dr. Leon Moscatel from our headache division, who will be giving us his expert advice on what you can do for a headache patient who is unable to take triptans. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that in this talk, we use names of commercially available devices, but we do not receive any compensation from the manufacturers. Thank you. Great to have you, Leon. Let's dig right in. Typically, you know, we start off prescription migraine treatment with triptans, but for anyone in practice, we always have a few patients that we come across who are unable to take triptans or unable to tolerate them. How do we go about treating these patients? This is a great question, and thankfully one that has an increasing number of answers as headache research evolves. Leon, before we talk about triptan alternatives, we should really talk about triptans themselves and when they are indicated. So to review, the triptan family is a 5-HT1B1D serotonin agonists that are FDA approved for treatment of acute migraine attacks in patients who have insufficient response to NSAIDs. So I have to ask, who are the patients who we should not be prescribing or offering triptans to? Well, we love triptans as medications because overall they are safe. And in fact, they are actually over the counter in Europe. However, there are some patients that we do not recommend using triptans in. This group includes those patients who have had a recent heart attack or stroke and those who have uncontrolled hypertension. And remember, of course, we should also include patients who previously tried triptans and had a significant adverse reaction. They should be added to that list as well. That makes total sense. So for patients in these groups, what do you recommend that we do um, or prescribe? Instead of triptans, there are newer classes of medications that work through a different mechanism that we can use in these situations. These other treatment options are the GPANT class of medications, lismidodan, and external devices. The GPANTs are small molecule inhibitors of calcitonin gene-related peptide that arrived on the market beginning in 2019. There are currently three options with near equivalent efficacy, Remigipant, Ubrojipant, and the recently approved Atojipant. They can be very helpful options for patients to treat an acute migraine, and like triptans, are best taken at the onset of the headache. We found these medications to be very well tolerated, with the only contraindication being hypersensitivity to the medication. Remigipant is an oral dissolving tablet, so this one in particular may be helpful for patients who can't swallow pills or those who've had bad nausea associated with their migraine. Also, Remegipant is approved for preventive treatment as well. I see, very helpful to know, but it sounds like they work very differently from triptans. Um, what about my patients who had great results in treating their migraines with triptans, but no longer can use them due to new health changes like a recent MI or a recent stroke? Is there something that we can offer that are that works very similarly to triptans? Well, lismidodan is a second alternative we mentioned earlier, and this particular medication works similarly to the triptans, but acts on the 5-HT1F receptor and therefore has no vasoconstrictive effect. This makes it a safe option for the patients you mentioned with the recent MI or stroke. We find that lismidodan is often best used in patients in whom triptans previously helped but now have a contraindication. It's really important to note, though, that lismidodin is a Schedule 5 controlled substance, and patients need to be counseled that it can make them quite drowsy, and you should warn them that they should not drive for at least eight hours after taking the medication. So if you are prescribing this, make sure to include this in the written instructions. Got it. It sounds like actually this may be a great medication to consider in the evening or at bedtime. Moving on, what about patients who are hesitant or unable to take these medications? Are there any non-medication options that we can offer for these patients? 
Yes, actually, there are several devices to consider for the treatment of acute migraine, but the two that we use most commonly are remote electrical neuromodulation and uh, the supraorbital nerve stimulator. The first device is remote electrical neuromodulation called Nerivio and is an armband worn for 45 minutes at the start of a headache. While many clinical trials for devices are of low quality, the Nerivio had an adequate trial and we have integrated this device into practice. And for our tech savvy patients, this device can really be a nice option because they can control the device with an app on their phones and modulate the device's sensation on their arm to find a comfortable and effective setting. Oh, how cool is that? That is fantastic. The second device is the combined occipital and supraorbital nerve stimulation device, also known as Relivion. It is a headband worn for 45 minutes at the start of a headache. The third option is external trigeminal nerve stimulation device, ETNS, also known as Cephaly. It stimulates the trigeminal nerve. It has options for use as both acute treatment and also as a preventive. Got it. Um, I have to ask, as primary care providers, how do we get these for patients? Well, Nerivio and Relivion are available by prescription only. Cephaly is actually available directly from the manufacturer without a prescription. It's important to remember, though, that sometimes they can be quite pricey and devices are oftentimes not covered by insurance. There are other devices to consider, but again, they're pricier and less accessible for patients. Understood. Thank you so much. This was extremely informative. I learned a lot personally about neural alternatives um, and hopefully this will help our viewers as well. Thank you so much, Leon, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And as always, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. We hope that you can continue watching our videos as we explore other topics in neurology. Bye, see you next time.